Hello, hello, hello! Boy, do we have a lot to talk about regarding November Showcase. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to take this time to, you know, welcome everyone to the channel. Because, sincerely, without you guys, none of this would be possible, okay? So thank you so, so, so much for your support. Now, if you enjoy my content, or perhaps even have an opposing viewpoint, please feel free to leave it in the comment section below, as I'm trying to gather different opinions to make a separate video with them. The showcase itself was over 30 minutes long, so I've done my best to condense all of the information given into a shorter video format. You know, given that you people, according to my YouTube metrics, have the attention span of a minute 38 seconds. Now, without further delay, let's jump right in, shall we? The showcase announcement debuted a couple of days before this video going up, and NCSoft really, really addressed all the pain points the community have expressed since the NA technical test. John Gok, the developer, started by saying that they created a world that felt infinite, so that players were encouraged to dive in and explore it in a variety of different ways, such as dungeons, exploration, contracts, world bosses, siege battles, crafting, and many more. Instead of feeling like they had to log in to complete a set of repetitive tasks. He proceeds on to expand on the impact the weather and day-night systems have on combat, whether PvE or PvP, meaning certain content will only be available during the day or during the night. And a rainstorm or an eclipse, for example, could gain you a strategic position in a castle siege. The day cycle lasts for 2 hours and the night for 30 minutes. These cycles are going to play a pivotal role in how players interact with each other throughout the open world. The next topic the producer touches on in the showcase is weapon diversity. Their intention was not to pigeonhole players into specific character roles. This is why you can create up to 21 different classes through these weapon combinations. They have also implemented a failsafe to prevent weapons and skill progression from penalizing players, with pesky things such as downgrades or, in more severe cases, item loss. Furthermore, and arguably the most important, is the transfer system that allows players to move all of the progress from one weapon to another. Next up, we have dungeons. There are two types, field dungeons and instance dungeons. Field dungeons are not level gated, so anyone practically, even from a very early start, can participate in them. These dungeons entry, however, are subject to the weather and day night cycle. Instance dungeons, in contrast, are zone content for you and your group to explore and tackle the different gimmicks each one will offer. John Gok highlights that although these dungeons are available early on, it will be necessary to complete them in groups. All in all, there is plenty of content Throne and Liberty will offer players to progress via PvE dungeons. Alright, now let's talk guild content. I know most of us are aware how impactful guilds can be for your character's growth. NCSoft is doubling down on this concept in Throne and Liberty. Character and guild progression are tied together essentially making each guild member's contributions grow the guild and in turn having more guild rewards available for them to further aid their character's growth. Another immensely impactful type of content are guild raids. These can be accessed only by the respective guild members and also provide materials needed to progress your characters. Similar to open world field bosses or instance dungeon loot, these guild raids allow you to play with your guild to procure enhancement materials. Fighting for control over region-dominant castles and guild sieges was the beating heart of Lineage 2, so you bet your bottom dollar NCSoft will carry that tradition into its successor, Throne and Liberty. In addition to having a state-of-the-art siege system, which consists of golems and other siege weapons, players will also need to utilize the weather and day-night cycle to gain an advantage on their enemies, to create strategic plays, and execute high levels of coordination on a mass scale. The most pressing question regarding sieges and mass content is optimization. And it is incredible to hear the developers say that if there's one thing that they weren't willing to compromise on was the game's fidelity when it came to these large-scale battles. Alright, lastly, let's talk about taxes. Once you've taken dominion of a castle, your guild can begin collecting taxes from the surrounding regions. But you have to transport these tax earnings yourself, leaving you vulnerable to enemy ambushes and attacks. The coffer will be transported by a golem that has to be protected, similar to caravans in Arc Age or trade wagons in BDO. This opens up a multitude of diplomatic dynamics, such as alliances between opposing guilds, to take down bigger and more powerful ones. Alright, next up, let's talk combat. Given that Throne and Liberty has been in development for such a long time, they already had a concept in the database for a dynamic live-action combat system, similar to BDO. 
The developer explained that the vision for the game's combat was centered around a more strategic combat approach that had tap target and made you evaluate the position of your forces in mass scale combat. Now, I completely agree with this. BDO might have a phenomenal combat system, but once you introduce large player numbers in mass scale PvP, no one can disagree it's a total shit show. He mentioned that they turned the dial perhaps a little too far the other way. That is why after all the flack they received in the Korean beta test, they were able to find a comfortable medium between the action combat system they'd already designed and the ones players criticized. He went on to say that the combat is not yet finished, that they will continue to make changes to it and iterate from player feedback several months after launch, when the new regions are introduced. And last, but certainly not least, monetization. And Seasoft is trying to diverge from the pay-to-win structures with Throne and Liberty. It might be in part because of Korea's stricter laws on gambling found in video games and its exposure to minors. Either way, this is fantastic news. The game will offer a Battle Pass and a Growth Pass. The Growth Pass are items you will collect only once as you reach different milestones within the game and the Battle Pass will be similar to a subscription where you will have an available amount of extra items to collect on a monthly basis. It is important to note that once you have completed the battle pass, you will have to wait until next month's reset for extra rewards, diminishing the advantage, if any, this pass could give some players. And for those hardcore gamers out there like myself, you can continue to progress in the game by simply playing. And although you will not be able to collect any further battle pass rewards until next monthly reset, you can still earn another type of currency called points, which can be spent to purchase upgrade materials, etc. Essentially, the more you play, the more you progress. The other method of monetization is skins for your characters, pets, and morphs. But these options do not attribute in any way, shape, or form player power. It is purely aesthetic. Free-to-play gamers can also rejoice, as Throne of Liberty will also offer a free pass on launch, which will offer materials and cosmetics. And lastly, there is this currency called Lucent which is earned in-game or via the cash shop, and it is used to purchase directly from the marketplace. I know what you're thinking, this is exactly pay to win, and you would be right. However, I've heard from many testers that this currency will probably not be enough to whale, well, since the items sold on the marketplace are extremely few and far in between. I personally do not like this, and I wish NCSoft would just remove this currency altogether and just leave the progress passes instead, but I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens and how everything plays out. The game is set to launch in Korea on December 7th this year. It will introduce two massive regions with 19 territories, 8 cities and 6 dungeons. Throne and Liberty will also offer 2 world bosses and 18 field bosses between these two regions alone. Furthermore, John Gok mentioned that given the lengthy amount of time the game has been in development, they already have two entire additional regions made and ready to release 3-4 to four months after launch. The first region, Talandre, and the second region, Draco Rift. In addition to these new regions, the developers also plan to simultaneously release new weapon types such as spears and fist weapons on these new content updates. And Seasoft plans to release two to three major content updates a year after the game's launch. With all that being said, I kind of wanted to give you guys a heads up on what the future channel upload schedule looks like. I'm currently wrestling with class finals, I also have a bunch of IRL stuff going on. I'm trying to play Dragonflight's last patch until Throne and Liberty releases, so probably won't be uploading until the game comes out on December 7th. But, you know, rest assured, we will continue to track this game's progress as it pertains to any further combat changes, content updates, etc. I will also be streaming the game full-time via Twitch and continue to make videos after launch, so please feel free to come by, drop by the channel anytime. I want to thank you for making it this far into the video and remind you to please subscribe and drop a like. It doesn't cost you anything, okay? And it helps me more than you know. Thank you. See you guys soon.